welcome to another episode of the Fantasy Writers Toolshed. I'm your host, Richie Belling, and today I'm delighted to welcome a truly special guest, former FBI special agent, Joe Navarro, who is an expert in body language. And the reason I've invited Joe along is to discuss the importance that nonverbal language has, particularly in writing. It really is one of the the best interviews I've ever had the the pleasure of doing on this show. So I think you're going to enjoy it. We've also got some brilliant guests confirmed for future episodes too. So if you don't want to miss them, be sure to subscribe or follow the show. And if you would like to support us and keep us doing these episodes and maybe even do even more regular ones, share it with anyone you think may be interested as well as on social media. If you'd like to get more involved in our buzzing writing community that's grown around this show, as well as get access to writing classes, books, interviews and guides, check out our Patreon page. And now it's time to dive right in and get some truly masterful insights from one of the world's leading experts on body language, Joan Navarro. I'm honoured to be joined today by former FBI special agents, best-selling author and a world-leading expert in body language, Joe Navarro. Joe, welcome to the show. Yeah, it's great to be here. Ah, oh, Thank you very much for joining me. Uh, I think when I, I sent you an email a few weeks ago, even I appreciated the randomness of it, um, re- reaching out to a- an expert in body language like yourself. But the reason why is because I think it plays such an important role in fiction and storytelling as a whole. I mean, Mm. if you look at like TV and film, body language is one of the main weapons of an actor uh, to convey how they're feeling or what they're thinking. And I suppose with books, we get a little bit more leeway, don't we? Because we can dive into the thoughts of a character. Uh, But I still think that there's a special thing about body language and for me, it's because if it's only suggested to us what a character's thinking, it's more interesting because we have to think about what yeah. what is that they, they could be pondering. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me on your program. Uh, somehow you convinced me to, <laughs> uh, to, to do it. And I think in part because I love good writing. I, I can appreciate good writing. Uh, you know, people say, well, you you've written 14 books. And I I say, well, uh, I'm more of an author than a a writer. Yeah. I think, uh, I think writing is a, a true skill set because it, it, it is both storytelling, but it's, but it's also, as you said, how do we convey emotion? Right. So we can say, well, the, the person looked troubled or, you know, Hillary Mantel would, uh, uh, who sadly passed away would, would say with, uh, with, with furrowed forehead, he, he, he looked down, uh, at his shoes or something and, uh, and maybe conveys, uh, the sentiment that way. So I, yeah. I have a, I have a high appreciation for those who dedicate themselves to writing. And I, having read, uh, about Hemingway, you know, and how he would uh, sit in front of that typewriter for two, three, four hours, just working on one sentence. And and if you yeah. stop and think about that, <laughs> it it just uh, it to this day it just it just tells me how much further I I need to go because when you think the the old man in the seat was written at the fourth grade level. And he won a Nobel Prize for that. Yeah. And then you go back and look at how he wrote that, and you realize that he had mastered words, but he had also mastered how to convey sentiments. And uh, and and really, uh, you know, I often speak as a as an anthropologist would. Our species primarily communicates nonverbally. And 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 though we we take it for granted and we don't really pay too much attention to it unless something really stands out, it is what defines great actors. When you look at uh, Marlon Brando or any any living actor, 
the great ones, you could turn the sound off and you could see it in their faces. Uh, yeah. Exactly what they're feeling, thinking, or uh, or desiring, and yeah. um, and so the y- your audience, uh, y- you know, people who are uh, writers or potential writers. I think to make writing interesting, I think nonverbals is an area that uh, really has to be mastered, as as Shakespeare did. I think it's it's definitely underused. Like you say, I've always thought it was more importance than dialogue arguably and like you've just confirmed it there haven't you that most of the, the communication that we share between us is non-verbal yeah it, 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 i mean think about it we things like trustworthiness we don't ask people if they're trustworthy we assess it from their body language we assess whether we're safe around other people based on their body language we we make this life changing decisions like who we're going to marry based on body language and 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 it's the primary means by which we communicate empathy yeah Um, so it's it's all around us it's always with us we just think that our words are important but i think as a as any good writer knows that the the subtle uh, nuance of of human emotion is really conveyed with with nonverbals. I mean, I, I was looking at a period piece last night, and and just the um, the subtle touch of of uh, uh, one hand against the gloved hand of the of the woman. Yeah. Okay. So there's not there's a nonverbal that's that's extremely powerful. Yeah, it, it, it just just that conveys so much information that she didn't move her hand away. Yeah, and uh, and you can draw a lot of inferences uh, from that. So, how, how did you find this particular interest in body language? You've had a really interesting career. Is this something that you've always been interested in, or is it something that you've sort of found as you've worked worked your way through life? Yeah, good question. Well, I, I was born in Cuba, uh, and I didn't speak English. And then when the uh, communists came, we fled, and we were uh, uh, exiled, uh, refugees, and ended up in uh, in Miami. And just out of necessity, I found that the only language I could trust uh, was the body language. Yeah, um, that uh, I couldn't speak English, <laughs> and and I know some Brits would say, "Well, you still can't, mate." But uh, <laughs> I get that. <laughs> but I, but I, but body language seemed to make sense to me. It was it was clean. It was pure. If somebody likes you, you know it. If they don't, you can tell. Uh, if they're genuine and so forth. And so I began to rely on it. By the time I got to, to college, um, I, I was studying uh, anthropology um, on my own, and, and I found it that it was fascinating to, yeah. to look at the, the gestures and, and just the, the body language around the world. And 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 even though my degree was in criminology, my really my field of study, my dedication was to 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 body language, and um, and it's one of the fortunate things in the United States that uh, uh, you y- you have the freedom to to study whatever you want. Yeah, uh, and and I did, and it interested me. Um, and and the the interesting thing about body language is nobody owns it. Psychologists think they own it, but they don't. Uh, anthropologists think they own it. Uh, ethologists think they own it. It's it's one of those ologies that everybody contributes to, but nobody yeah. owns. And because of that, at least when I was going to university, you really couldn't get a degree in it. So I just took it upon myself to to study it. Um, for no other reason than just to to please myself, and and you have, and of course you have a tremendous advantage when you can walk into a room and read the room, yeah, and you can and you, you can see where there's issues, there's concerns, who's getting along, who's not, 
all, all sorts of, of of things that you can infer from from body language because we evolved as a species to communicate nonverbally principally because at at least for the last 300,000 years from the time we were archaic humans we lived in a world where we were small we had no defenses we had no claws and we were surrounded by large predators namely felines yeah and we had to communicate silently and effectively uh and move about in, in a in very silently so it became our our primary means of communication we <laughs> You couldn't go through an African savanna going, hey, Charlie, what's going on? <laughs> we, we would have died out as a species. Yeah. Um, we had to uh, do so uh, very silently. And so we evolved things, which is part of our nonverbal repertoire, such as the freeze response. We hear a loud noise and we freeze in place. Yeah. Uh, we hear bad news and we freeze in place. Uh, because wh whoever made noise uh, attracted the predators, and and whoever ran would initiate the chase trip bite sequence that mm. uh, all fe uh, uh, all cats, all felines uh, um, use to uh, to catch uh, prey. So those who ran got eaten. Uh, those who who uh, remained very still got to pass on their genes and yeah. uh, and and thus much of our body language for instance the, the celebrations uh, around the world are always up and out right we raise our hands when we score a goal yeah and uh we don't have to be given a memorandum to do that uh it, it's universal that anything that is positive emotionally uh, we use gravity defying behavior so these these things are hardwired in us um a, as a species so i mean you mentioned there like the, the power of being able to walk into a room and reading it reading what people are thinking or feeling i mean how easy is it to interpret these things i mean you've devoted your life to it i mean yep. if if someone like a writer for example wants to learn a bit more about how to do that i mean what what yeah. sort of advice would you give them well, th there's a lot of advice. Uh, uh, we'll we'll keep it compacted here because there's yeah. a lot of great books. I mean, uh, everything that uh, Desmond Morris, who I uh, who for a long time lived in the UK, I, th I think he lives in Ireland now. A any book by by Desmond Morris who uh, uh, looks at at the world as a uh, zoologist is yeah. is is uh, is essential and well any any of my books if i can mention it uh what yeah, everybody is saying yeah. or the dictionary of body language which has about 400 behaviors what these books can do is help you to 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 say to look at for instance well what can we gain from this area of the body right so if you're a, a writer yeah. And you're looking for a way to show that somebody is stressed, but it's very subtle. You know, you could say, well, you know, the 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 muscles of the neck tightened, or his uh, Adam's apple jumped. Yeah. Well, we've seen that before in the literature. But what if you were to say there was uh, moisture began to build up? In the little area just below the nose, we call that the philtrum. So those yeah. lines down from the nose, those are the filtral columns. And and it, humans begin to sweat in this little area when we're when we're under uh, when we're under distress. Or um, you know, so somebody said something uh, nasty, and and there was no immediate reaction except for the the wings of his uh, nostrils yeah uh reddened just slightly and one might even say began to flare so yeah. th this this could be interpreted as a pre-event indicator the person's oxygenating and he's going to take a punch or or something 
I... So if you if you know the human body, for instance, um, the shoulders, that when we are uh, confident, we tend to uh, raise the shoulders uh, up dramatically and say, I don't know where you went, right? You can just <laughs> imagine both shoulders going up, hands palm up, and so forth. But how subtle a change it is when you describe somebody and says, and and he and he said, uh, I don't know where they went, but only one shoulder come up came up and the other one remained low. Well, yeah. that's lack of confidence. So you can you can use it to really heighten the sensation. Yeah. Of. Of understanding your character, understanding what that character is gro- going through. Uh, for instance, you could have a character that, uh, from the from the waist up, looks very calm and uh, and very serene during an interview, but under the table, you could you could say, well, and and he was wiping his hands on his uh, on his pant leg, or his ankle was quivering yeah and 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 then you realize oh this guy is masking from from the chest up which a lot of people can do poker players do that but it's very difficult to mask the whole body or or even something so so simple you know i I talked about earlier about the hand of the uh, in that period piece where he reached over and touched the woman's um gloved hand and and you know you you get a sense for they like each other uh the space between the hands and fingers for instance when we when we're confident the the distance between fingers tends to spread and when we lack confidence we we tend to withdraw the fingers uh, together or or hide the thumb yeah that's a really subtle one isn't it i've never noticed that one yeah, you often see this in at, at carnivals where they put people in this uh, spook house and they're 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 confronted with the uh, spooky things, and when they take a picture of them, you, you see the thumb uh, is uh, re- uh, retracted, and the reason for that is um, just like dogs uh, t- t- uh, tuck their ears in, humans tuck their their thumbs in so that. Um, we don't ca- uh, they don't catch on yeah. things as we're running through a jungle uh of course we don't run through a jungle anymore but <laughs> uh this was uh w- this was uh beneficial to us at least from when we were early hominins about 2.4 million years ago yeah till uh till about 6000 years ago when we uh, when we entered uh, mesopotamia that's crazy, isn't it? I was going to actually ask you about a few of these emotions, Joe, and the typical actions we might see in body language. You've mentioned a few really good ones, but I was going to ask you about dishonesty. If mm. someone was trying to hide something, what kind of... Yeah. Dishonesty is really difficult because... But, well, first of all, the research tells us that humans are really lousy at detecting deception now see now uh, it's bothering me i said entered mesopotamia about six thousand years ago <laughs> probably entered mesopotamia about 10 to thirteen thousand years ago but anyway there's there's a lot that's been written in the literature about deception and most of it is wrong the first of all there is no pinocchio effect there is no way to detect deception accurately using body language now humans are very good at reflecting that uh what i call in my book psychological discomfort so in in my book what everybody is saying i talk about psychological comfort and discomfort and that we humans from the time we're born reflect whether we're comfortable or uncomfortable and that discomfort uh, it can be because of the room is too warm, and so we begin to ventilate by lifting our clothing, or women lift their hair up, or because we don't like a question that uh, that we're being asked. Yeah. And when when we 
we are psychologically uncomfortable. Uh, we see manifestations that may be anxiety. Uh, it, it could be tension, uh, but it can also be uh, dislike and disdain. Uh, you often see this where I know I have a trouble trouble with this. Every time I go through uh, security at the airport, you yeah. know, and I'm thinking, what is the statistical significance of somebody my age doing something harmful? Yeah, and 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 I know that I, I probably have uh, an annoyed face, right? <laughs> I try not to because these people, God bless them, they're just trying to do their their job. But but I reflect in real time what I'm what I'm feeling. Yeah, and it has nothing to do with harming anybody. It has nothing to do with deception. But we are we do reveal um, our sentiments that way. And uh, and so I would tell writers, don't look for a behavior. You know, I remember in the 70s, you would still read a book where somebody said, oh, he touched his nose, and so he's lying. Or um, he looked up and to the left, and so he's lying. Or he, yeah. he covered his mouth. As a, <laughs> uh, It turns out the honest, uh, as well as the d- dishonest, uh, do that. But I think if, as a writer, if you want to be authentic and structure it around uh, their responses to questions, that uh, somehow uh, you you can see the psychological discomfort. I'll, I'll give you an example. Yeah. Right. So rather than go for a confession, you go for admissions because a hundred admissions. In a, in the end, equal confession. Now, in the movies, they they always go for the confession. That, you know, that's so much crap. Um, <laughs> because you know, I've done over thirteen thousand interviews, and yeah, and so <laughs> you don't set. I mean, yeah, you know that eventually, hopefully, you'll get a, a a confession, but that's not the bar you set. The bar you set is FaceTime. Get the person to talk to you for as long as possible, and eventually. Uh, they'll tell you everything. Yeah. And um, and so that's your first uh, objective. But the second one is I always went for little admissions. And what, and so rather than, uh, you know, did you shoot her with a Smith & Wesson 9 millimeter in the head <laughs> causing cranial damage? You just gave up so much yeah. to work with that even the innocent, would sit there visualizing this ma'am and you would see the psychological discomfort. And so I would parse it and uh, interwoven with other questions. I, I might say um, almost like uh, the old uh, uh, in the, in the old television show uh, Columbo yeah. say something, by the way, do, do you happen to own a gun? Yeah. And, and then you pause and you you wait to you wait for the answer, but you also look to see what's the reaction to that question. And they may come back and say, uh, "Yes, I I own a uh, a hunting rifle." Uh, ah, okay. Do you own a uh, Do you own a handgun? No, I, I, absolutely not. And then you 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 see the the confidence, right? So maybe they answer yeah. that with with a com what we call prosody which is the tone of voice and so forth and then you may follow up with with another question like well have you ever owned a a nine millimeter smith and wesson yeah and you know so by parsing uh things you can look to specific reactions i'll, I'll give you another example yeah Somebody uh, reports finding somebody uh, dead in their house, and of course they're under suspicion. Um, I, you know, I would begin with, well, when you when you got home, where did you park your vehicle? Did you park it on the street? Did you park it in the driveway, or do you have a, a garage? 
and uh, and then began to and when you got out of the car did you lock your car did you leave your keys in the car or did you go to the door and and then you go which door was the door locked or unlocked you know and then you take you you see what their reactions are to yeah. each and every question and what happens is they become accustomed to minutia they don't see it as threatening but if if somebody in my experience if somebody's harboring guilty knowledge the the incremental technique begins to to you begin to see more and more distress you may yeah. see the flushing of the skin you may uh, see you know the nervousness and and so forth where with the honest um they will as long as this has been your methodology they will tell you uh well i can't you know i can't remember i must have put the keys in my pocket because I never leave it in the car, and then I went to the front door, and and there, you know, I I found that the door was actually uh, ajar, and you don't see the psychological discomfort. But when you when you load a question with too many things, uh, then it really loses its validity yeah. as far as being able to assess accurate. Uh, information so it's almost impossible you you can describe something so horrific that the person for the next 20 minutes will be trying to you know clean their brain yeah. uh of of what you just uh, uh discussed and and i've seen uh i've seen a lot of investigations ruined that way yeah i imagine that because it's so in them interviews it's so finely balanced isn't it it's like a real Oh, I don't know how you do it really. Thirteen thousand as well isn't an amazing number. So I, I and what what kind of things would you be looking for then? I mean, it it, it has to be, I'm guessing some of these people that you've had to interview are like masters of deception and it's like a cat and mouse, I can imagine. Like you're just looking for the tiniest little thing that could just Well, yeah, that's a good question. Well, first of all, I think you need to get I wouldn't say there are masters of deception. I, I I would say that there are people who habitually lie. Yeah. And if they're not questioned, right? If if I as a person don't do my due diligence and question what they say, then then yeah, they're going to get away with a lie. I, I remember uh, uh, years ago I ran into a guy and uh, my my mother uh introduced me as a as a FBI agent she was very proud and i i really didn't want anybody to know i was uh you know an FBI agent but she did and uh, she said well so and so um uh he he had similar work and i i go oh okay and uh, what were you and you know, i he said well i i was um i was in military intelligence so, oh that's interesting and uh i never believe anything anybody says because it, 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 it it's not that i shouldn't say i don't believe it's yeah. i always remember it's self reporting right yeah well you can self report anything <laughs> <laughs> and and so i followed up with a, a, a really it was a benign question but it was pointed and i said um Oh, uh, did you work with the 902nd? And he he paused to think for a minute, and he says, "Yes, of course." And and so then I invented a, a number. Yeah. Uh, 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 oh, and I said, "Well, then surely you you must have worked with the 83rd MI group also." <laughs> and uh, and he said, "Oh, yes, of course, uh, very familiar." Well, I just made that up. <laughs> oh, and. Nice. And as it turns out, this guy had been bamboozling people um, oh, really? in, in this condominium, telling them that he was military. And the guy never served. I mean, you could just tell you could just look, uh, take a look at the way he walked. That, uh, But 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 yeah, some people just 
you know, they, they habitually lie. Yeah. Uh, but if you don't call them on it, but I, I've yet to meet uh, someone who could cognitively uh, keep up with a proper interview because lying uh, places such a cognitive load that you might remember, for instance, I'll give you an example. Here's one your readers will appreciate. A liar will remember the facts he wants to convey, right? Yeah. Oh, I, I came home and I found her dead. Okay, that one's easy. What they what they don't think about is the emotions that they felt each step of the way. And that place is a cognitive load. Yeah. And they have to really think hard about, oh, how should I be feeling at this moment? How should I be feeling at this moment? How should I be really feeling at this moment? So a simple question would be, well, as soon as you open the door, um, what did you feel? Yeah. And somebody might say, uh, well, I just, I had a sense something was, was wrong. Okay. And then as you, as they reveal that they found a body or whatever, you ask, well, how did you feel at that moment? Now, feelings register, especially strong negative ones, register in the hippocampus. And the hippocampus, of which we have two, keep a pretty good record of everything negative. And we evolved that so that we only burn our hands once. On yeah, the stove. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> So everything negative goes right to the hippocampus and it stays there. And, uh, and so for the, uh, for the liar, they have to think hard about, oh, what's the emotion I should be feeling right now? And, nice. uh, and that's always an interesting uh, area to, to pursue. Cause I, I've literally had them sit there looking at the heavens thinking, how should I answer this? <laughs> And they don't realize that the clock is ticking. Yeah. And and they're they're thinking. Uh and, and sometimes they'll actually say it as a question. I was uh I was traumatized. Yeah, like not sure. <laughs> like, well you either were or you weren't. Yeah. I mean, uh, tell you people must have had no chance going up against you, Joe. Well, l let me say this. I I went up against some very good liars. Um yeah. and uh and 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 I can tell you that they were able to get away with the lies because in in those instances I didn't have access to the evidence, right? Yeah. So I I one of the best liars I ever went up against was a a woman um who uh, committed espionage. She eventually uh, was committed to 25 years but the evidence of everything she said was overseas or in the possession of russians and the russians yeah. weren't being very helpful then and they're not <laughs> being very helpful now and uh and so there was no way for me to contradict anything that she said yeah and she knew it she she said, well, you know, well, you could she was stationed in Germany. She said, well, you could go to Germany and 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 check it out. Well, eventually we did. And it took about six months to catch up with her lies. But it wasn't so much that she was clever at lying. They they flowed from her. Yeah. It was just that we were hard pressed to corroborate everything she said and yeah. and mind you and people forget this that it doesn't matter for, for an fbi agent it doesn't matter if you're honest or dishonest if if you're going to use information from let's say a witness and you're going to go to court you have to corroborate what they said yeah you know if they said hey, i was standing here on this street and i could look down and i could see this happen you have to go out there at the same time of day and and see if you can corroborate that because if you don't defense counsel will so um 
people think we only corroborate or try to corroborate what the what the bad guys say. No, we have to corroborate both because yeah. otherwise, uh, well, you're an attorney. Uh, yeah. Defense counsel will just shove it down your throat. Yeah. And say, well, uh, Mr. Navarro, did you stand in that corner? No, sir, I don't. Well, did you know that if you look down that road, you can't see anything? Oh. <laughs> Beyond all oh. reasonable doubts, isn't it? Well, it, you know, it, 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 people have uh, faulty memories and, and, yeah. and so forth. And Definitely, they think yeah. they saw, they think they heard. And uh, I, I'll never gaps. forget the, the first time I went to a bank robbery. I was in Phoenix, Arizona. And this was a time when uh, uh, banks, my gosh, they would have six, seven tellers at the same time. Yeah. And uh, I remember taking statements from them, and they all described the gun differently. And I was in shock. I I always thought that human memory was like a video recording. Yeah. And, and you realize that it's not, that the person who... Uh, had been directly in front of the bank robber she described this huge gun and everybody else who uh, saw the event described the weapon differently everything from a six shot revolver to a to a, a shiny uh, pistol and I, I you know it's like are you serious <laughs> oh i had scratch you <laughs> but uh, but you know that's that's what you go to court with 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 whatever the witnesses you know yeah. so you you go out and you get uh seven or eight different guns and you put them on a, a photo lineup and you try to narrow it down so, well i've got so. one final question for you joe yeah um you've written 14 books is that right so yes. far and I know that you mentioned to me that you were starting to look towards fiction writing, which is very exciting because it's you've got so much experience and insights. I can't wait to read what you're working on. So oh, well, thank as, you. Yeah, as you've been working on this, how have you applied your experiences and what sort what advice would you give to anyone out there listening who's looking to utilize body language a bit more in their stories? Yeah. Well, first of all, thanks for uh, encouraging me because I need it. <laughs> uh, as as Hemingway said, writing is easy. You sit in front of a typewriter and bleed. <laughs> um, I find writing uh, uh, prose is is very difficult because for 25 years I wrote as an FBI agent, and so writing prose is uh, is very difficult. But I would encourage everyone to include the body language. Uh, because it it just gives it greater flavor. It it gives it greater nuance. Uh, think of your audience, right? So there are cultures which are very rich in nuance, right? So uh, in Asia, Japan, uh, the Middle East, um, much of the Mediterranean countries, and so the gestures the 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 physical responses uh, convey a lot of information uh where yes in certain cultures words are more predominant but it just adds so much uh to it and it's one of those things that can help you to shape the feelings at the person because because of what we call mirror neurons Right. So if you if if you purse your lips right in, in the forward position and then dramatically pull them to the left or right. If you were to sit there and and study how you feel, you would feel, oh, this really feels negative or or I do that when I disagree. It, it just adds more to the description of what a, a person may be feeling. And in the end, it's easy for an editor to take it out if. If he does, if he or she doesn't like it, or if it doesn't hit the spot, yeah. Um, but it's so much more difficult to add it in later. Yeah. Um, and so I would, I would, I would argue, you know, you, you you look at somebody like Hemingway, and 
you know, his language, his, his prose was so sparse. But then you, you read somebody like F. Scott Fitzgerald or uh, Hilary Mantel, and you see the richness of the body language, and you really feel like you're there observing, uh, feeling the, uh, the sentiments. Yeah. Yeah. Ah. Oh. Fantastic. Joe, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me. It's It's been an amazing conversation. I think you've been one of my favorite guests on the show, definitely by far. So thank you I very will, much uh, uh, Thank you. And as I'm looking at your body language, I think you're actually being honest. <laughs> <laughs> Can't get away with that, would you? <laughs> but Joe, how can we find out a bit more about you? Well, you can just uh, plug my name into to to, to uh, Google and uh, it'll come up. But uh, joenavarro.net should get you to my website. And all my books are in the major bookstores and certainly on Amazon. Yes. And uh, I would encourage uh, them to, uh, yeah, browse browse the books and 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 pick out some some really good uh, body language to convey. Uh, the 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 feelings and and i would also add don't focus so much on the face those are the easy ones yeah focus on the little things that we do with the rest of our body uh with our hands uh, uh with our legs and so forth and uh and add to the to the richness of uh of understanding your character amazing joe yeah. thank you again and thank you everyone right. for listening. Joe, a big, big thank you again for giving up time out of your very busy schedule to chat with me about body language. And again, like you say at the start, you don't do a lot of these interviews. So I'm sure if you're listening at home and you enjoyed that, you've, you're very grateful to Joe. Uh, it's, it is a real pleasure to interview people at the very top of, the, of their field. And I learned so much from just chatting to joe for for that hour and um hope you learned something new too if you enjoyed today's episode be sure to follow or subscribe and if you really did enjoy it please consider leaving us a rating on the spotify mobile app or a quick little review on itunes too a quick share on social media also helps us out an awful lot and the more people who listen the more episodes we can do and if you'd like to get involved in our writing community and get access to fantasy writing classes, books, interviews, guides, and much, much more, just check out our Patreon page. You can also join one of our half dozen writing groups with people meeting up re- uh, every two or three weeks to get feedback on their works in progress. So yeah, check out the links in the description. And we'll be back on the 14th of March with a very interesting interview with one of the world's best-selling fantasy authors and it's someone that you probably haven't heard of before but it's going to be fascinating and I really can't wait to bring you that one so that'll be coming out on the 14th of March and until then keep on scribbling